Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Bartles, and I am the current HEC HMS team lead, but we do rotate that position around quite a bit. Uh, the HEC HMS team has been releasing new versions at a much faster pace than previous years, and specifically since early 2020, we've made seven official releases of HMS. We used to make one a year, possibly two a year, or we'd make one every other year, so much, much faster than we used to. We want to make sure everybody is aware of the new features uh, that we put into the software in addition to all of the updated documentation and training materials. So to increase awareness of that, we're going to begin holding quarterly webinars. This is the first of those webinars uh, devoted to HEC HMS enhancements. In this one, we're going to cover updated documentation and training materials related to HMS in addition to two new features, discretizations and spatial results. The speakers for today are Matt Fleming and Tom Brower. Matt Fleming is the Chief of the Hydrology and Hydraulics Technology Division at HEC. Within that division, we develop HEC HMS, HEC RAS, and HEC SSP. Tom Brower is the lead developer of HEC HMS, and he's bringing us all into the 21st century in terms of software development practices, and sometimes we go kicking and screaming. This webinar is being recorded, just want to let you guys know, and the video will be posted to our website soon. Um, everyone is on mute, so trying to keep disturbances down to a minimum. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat. We'll do our best to answer them as we go in the chat, but if we don't get to them, we will try to uh, get them at the end. We're going to leave some time at the end for, for questions and answers. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Matt and Tom. All right. Thank you, Mike. So I'll get going here first. I'm going to talk about some of the new training material that we have available. All right. And so the, the new website that we have for what I call tech transfer is we're using a new web-based approach to delivering our user's manual. So no longer um, are we releasing a PDF with every software release. What we have now are this, this web-based approach where we can make those changes to the user documentation whenever we need to. And those changes are live the moment we save it. And so the nice thing, the really nice thing about that is if we don't do a good job describing something or if there's a typo or if we need to add something else to the user documentation, we can make those changes, hit the Save button, and then those are going to be automatically pushed to the public. Anybody can see those changes as we go. So we have those. So we have the user's manual here on this slide, um, and I'll have a, some more information about how you can find these in just a second. So the user's manual, the technical reference manual, and some other documentation that we have um, traditionally had with HMS. But some new, newer tech transfer options that we have that I want, want to make you aware of. We have the tutorials and guides. And so this is an opportunity for us to create those two to four to five page documents that walk through how to use a new feature in a release. And, or some of the, the older features that we just want to make sure folks are aware that those are in the, in the software and provide a data set that people can use and walk through as they go through that tutorial. So those are now available, and we're fleshing those out as we go. And the newest option we have on our tech transfer page are training material. And so I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, if you go to the main HMS webpage, it's going to look something like this. So this change was made yesterday. And so on the documentation page, really now that only that contains links to the documentation, so to that web-based documentation. So if you want to see the release notes, then you would click on this link right here, and you would go to that other website to see the release notes for version 4.7. Um, if you want to see archived material, you would just click the drop-down right there, and you can see from past releases, this is the documentation that would go to that, that release. Um, so here we have just the documentation. If you see the next option below documentation, there's training. So this is the newest option here on the HMS website. You're going to see the link to those tutorials and guides. Also, there's this training area right here. And so in March, we have our first opportunity to do a remote prospect class. It's the basic HMS prospect class. And what we did this year is we created YouTube videos for all the, the modules, we created web-based workshops. And so when you click on that link right there, I'm just going to go to it and show you. Over here. I'm going to go to training and then click on this link right here. Then you go to our basic HMS class. 
March 2021. And you can see this table right here is going to show you all the different modules, so lectures. So there's, I think, 12 lectures in the class. There's 10 workshops. And for each of those, we tried to break up the content into bite-sized chunks. So instead of watching one YouTube video that was one hour, we tried to break those up into five to 15 minute chunks so that if you had a certain amount of time between doing all the other things that you're doing and just wanted to watch that specific video, then you could do that. And then for each of the workshops as well, we broke up what we had traditionally for the workshops into smaller size chunks too. So for example, in the very first workshop we have right here for creating a simple model using HMS, if you want to look at just creating a new BASA model, you could click on that component and go to that specific portion of the workshop. If you want to look at just creating a new MAP model, then you could click on that link right there. We have all that content posted on the website. Anybody can have access to this. Corps of Engineers or public can go to this site. Um, and it's also, also we included the PowerPoint slides. So if you want to download those two as well, they're right there. And then also on the training side, I wanted to point this out too. This is new as of yesterday evening. So for this webinar series, we're posting the PowerPoint. So you can download the PowerPoint slides. And then once the video has been edited, we'll upload that video to this website too. So that's training. I talked about this. There is the uh, link to get to the training material. Or you can just access it from this, this web page right here. And then the last thing I'll talk about before turning it over to Tom is the discourse page. So the discourse page is where we like to, or we're promoting to help answer those questions. And so, um, for example, the types of questions that we have posted to this page. So here was a suggestion about a future enhancement right here. So export junction location. And so somebody was asking about taking those, those junctions in the basin model and creating a shape file so that you could load that into ArcGIS or whatever GIS tool you're using and display those junction locations. That's a great idea. We would love to do that. And it looks like that's coming up in a future release. And so that was posted and then we were able to add some content to it. Um, and here's the one right below it, discretization grid cells disappear. So there was a, a bug that somebody was running into. And so they posted that bug report there and then Tom was able to to get the project, reproduce the, the issue, and then fix the issue, and then hopefully that issue is going to be fixed here in one of the version 4.8 beta releases. So if you would like to start submitting your questions, your bugs, um, you name it, you can start using this discourse page. Anybody within the Corps of Engineers can submit um, an item to discourse. Um, it's publicly viewable. So you got to be careful what you submit, so make sure that you submit. Whatever you do submit, realize that anybody in the public can see it. Folks from the public cannot submit questions to it. They can only view it. All right. All right, I'll stop there and turn it over to Tom for discretization. All right. And I'm sharing my screen. All right, let's talk about discretizations. So, Discretizations. We have three different ways shown here that we've discretized the the, uh, the basin. So, in the left, we have one parameter set for the entire modeling domain. In the middle, it looks like we're using three sub basins. So each sub basin can have its own parameterization. And finally, on the right, we have a gridded discretization. So each grid cell can have its own parameterization. And then with the discretization, we can also apply gridded boundary conditions. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this concept and how to achieve it. So a little bit on the history. NextRAD, the modern implementation of NextRAD that we know of, started in 1988. And one of the innovations that came along with NextRAD was that there was this ATRAP grid that mosaic all of the radar data together. So now we have a single grid of all the radar data, and we can do things with it. We can, we can apply it to our hydrologic models. So then there was this program developed at HEC in the 90s called Mod Clark, which attempted to bring in this NextRAD data and other GIS data 
and it was like a preprocessor for HTC One at the time. And the Mod Clark, the classic diagram is shown here. And this is kind of that that little standalone pro, uh, Mod Clark program was the predecessor to Mod Clark as we know it today, and HEC HMS. So that was the mid '90s. That was developed. We're using the gridded precipitation from from the the Nextrad radar, which is higher accuracy and better spatial coverage than anything we had before. And then in 1998. HEC HMS 1.0 was released, and I am assuming it had the Mod Clark grid cell file as we know it as part of it. My version history only goes back to 2002, so there's a four-year gap, but the ability to read in a Mod Clark grid cell file was in the, uh, the oldest code that I have, so I, I'm pretty sure it went all the way back to 1.0. If somebody does have HEC HMS 1.0, please send it to me. I'd love to see it. Just don't send me any floppy disks because my computer doesn't do anything with those. So, <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, so yeah, 1.0 HECHMS 1998, and then the Mod Clark grid cell file really hadn't changed since then, or anything that we've done with it. It's it's been around since then, and so 22 years later, uh, discretizations were born, and it was kind of a modern um, a modernization of that classic uh, Mod Clark grid cell file. So just looking inside of the ModCard grid cell file, this is what is output from that geoprocessing step. So people would usually do this in GeoHMS, and GeoHMS would process the geospatial data and give this output file. This output file is really lean and mean, and so it has every, everything we need and nothing we don't. And so you see um, it says X chord, Y chord. I think of these as IJ indices. And then we have a travel length and an area. So what you do not see is a spatial reference or a coordinate reference system in this file. And you also don't see anything like a grid cell size. Now, yeah, you could probably back it out based on some assumptions, but we have no guarantees on grid cell size here. So we've kind of thrown away some valuable information, and we'll look at why that's valuable here in a minute. And we have this real lean mean file. So in versions 4.2 and 1 and prior, you had the opportunity to specify this grid cell file once for the entire basin. And you can see that here in what we call the component editor. You can see a path to a grid cell file. Now, that isn't a directory. It turns out that in previous versions, grid cell files could also be files with no extension, which was a bug in 4.7 because I did not know that <laughs> until somebody reported it. So, uh, yep, there's the specification for the grid cell file for the basin. And then fast forward to 4.3, which must have been three or four years ago now, and we started experimenting with this grid regions concept. And so this was kind of a first cut at modernizing what the grid cell file did. And what the grid region allows you to do is you could have this grid region that points it at a grid cell file, and then you could apply a default grid region for the entire basin model, or you could override that grid region for, at the, on the transform tab. And at, we we kind of saw the workings of this from 4.3 to 4.6.1. And as a team, we decided that this concept of the grid region or the discretization uh, really belonged to the subbasin and not kind of to the basin and kind of to the transform. We wanted to clarify where that lives. And so we made it a property of the subbasin itself. So you can see here in version 4.7 and newer, the discretization is a method, just like the canopy, the surface, the loss, the transforming the base flow. And for each subbasin element, now we have a tab that says discretization, and we can parameterize that discretization. Now, with that, with a lot of the, with all of the HMS. Uh, sub-basins, we can globally edit them. So it just fits right into that same global editing framework. So now for each sub-basin, you can specify the discretization projection and grid cell size, and that's what you see here. So now I'm just going to demo this a little bit and show you what it looks like. So I have I have a project in 461, so remember this is pre-discretizations. 
And this basin model, September 2018, is using this SHD def default, sorry, SHG default grid region. And to bring that into 4.7, I'm going to close 4.6.1, and then I'm going to open the same project in 4.7. So to bring that forward, I'm just going to convert the project. And here I can open my basin model. And now we can see that my sub-basins now have a discretization. So it migrated that. And this is what we call a file-specified discretization. So this is just saying the definition for this discretization is in this file. And that's all there is to it. Now the next modernization step is to go from this file specified step uh, file specified discretization so that's just pointing at a dot mod file to what we call a structured discretization and a structured discretization is the modernization of the mod Clark grid cell file it's actually stored uh, in a sqlite file and it includes things like spatial projection and grid cell size so we can actually visualize it in space so to upgrade this model i'm going to go to the gis menu Sorry, I'm going to go to the parameters menu. And for discretization, I'm going to change the method to structured. So I'm going to change it for all the subbasins. And I can go look at that on the global editor. And I can see that the default projection and grid cell size, uh, default projection is SHD, grid cell size is 2,000 meters. That's great. That's what I had for my dot mod file. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-compute these. I'm going to pre-compute the grid cells. To pre-compute the grid cells, we do have to have terrain data and flow direction data, because remember, part of this dot mod process is calculating the travel length to the outlet for each grid cell. So I do have that in that project, and this item is available. You'll notice there's also a create a grid cell file option here. Both the, the create a grid cell file option was added in 4.5, I believe. And then this is for computing the new structured discretizations. And they both use the same algorithm internally. And one thing that I'll say is that this algorithm is probably an order, in my testing, an order of magnitude faster than what you would have experienced with GeoHMS. So I tested on my middle Columbia basin and it took and GeoHMS to, to create a dot mod file it took upwards of an hour and then in HMS it was on the order of a minute and a half I want to say. So if you're still creating dot mod files and GeoHMS stop <laughs> that would be the point there. But you can see here I've just created the discretizations for all of my sub-basins. And so that was pretty painless and easy. I've upgraded this project to the new discretization approach. And like I said, one of the nice things about knowing where your grid cells are, are is that you can visualize them. And, and you can visualize things like spatial results, like Matt's going to show here in a bit. OK, so that is an example of a structured discretization. Let's look at unstructured really quick. So an unstructured discretization just uses, it was, it was added to accommodate, we started getting into this 2D overland flow world. And so in hydrology now, we're using the RAS 2D overland flow engine. And one of the pieces that, that work effort really pushed this discretization concept to where it is now. And so we needed to be able to accommodate an unstructured mesh for a subbasin. And so that's what I'll demonstrate here is importing a RAS 2D mesh as a unstructured discretization. So I've selected my basin model, and I'm going to go to File, Import, HEC RAS HDF5 file. I'm going to browse to it. It's a plan, a RAS plan file. Browse to it here, select it. Select the basin model that I want to apply it to, which is Redwood Creek 2D. Then I'm going to select my sub-basin, which is Redwood Creek. And then here's just some information. This is 3,099 grid cells and one boundary condition. So I'll finish. It's going to import it. And one thing I can do to actually, it was added. I can turn this discretization layer on and see my unstructured mesh. So that's how you would import uh, RAS mesh into HMS to run a 2D overland flow type simulation. 
that's that. Let me bring my slides back over. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that for the structured discretization, those live in a SQLite file in the project directory. It'll be named the same name as the basin model. And so if you're GIS savvy, you can pull that, that SQLite file into something like QGIS that recognizes a SQLite file and view the discretization layer and do whatever you want with it. So that's where it lives. So that's like the modern form of that dot mod file. It's this layer in the SQLite file. All right. So key points, discretizations are fully spatially aware. That allows us to visualize grid cells. It allows to visualize results on a per grid cell basis. So Matt's going to demonstrate that. And it also allows us to reproject grid cell indices based on incoming meteorologic data. So no longer does your meteorologic data necessarily have to perfectly match the the basin model or the, the grid cell file in discretization. With the discretization, we can reproject. We actually reproject the grid cells to match all of the incoming meteorologic grids. So if there's a mismatch there, it's okay now. And then discretizations are set for each sub-basin, and that allows us to mix and match uh, discretizations within the modeling domain, like Mike's done here with his Truckee River project. He has structured discretizations in most of the sub-basins, and then in this one sub-basin of interest where water is going outside of the floodplain, he's using an unstructured discretization. And so that's... That's everything on discretizations. There's a link here to doing that conversion that I talked about. This is in our tutorials and guides. So if you want to update a project with a HTC Geo HMS dot, dot mod file to the new structured discretization, pretty much what I just showed here, there's a tutorial on how to do that at the link there. So that's all I have. I'm going to pass to Matt for the spatial results. All right, so let's move on to spatial results. This is exciting. This is the continued push that the HMS team has to make more of the software GIS aware, right? So hydrology is so GIS aware. It's really important to, to see the watershed, to look at the processes that are going on in the watershed. And so we have added some initial capability for spatial results. We had some funding from the Flooding Coastal R&D program through um, some of the, the snow melt work to add the initial cut for spatial results. And now we're, we're transitioning to the SWIMS National Implementation Program to flesh out some of those capabilities to make, just add new bells and whistles so that modelers have all these tools that really help them diagnose what's going on in the models, to, to see the results, to display those results to other folks and to help them really improve the model. And so we have on this slide, um, we have on the right, um, this is the, the gridded representation of the spatial results. So as Tom was mentioning, if you have a structured discretization of 2,000 kilometers, then you can see those results there at that resolution. Um, if you're not looking at gridded modeling, if you don't have gridded precipitation, but you still want to make use of spatial results, then the figure on the left shows, well, now the program can also display those results at the sub-basin scale, too. All right, so the requirements for spatial results. Just like Tom was mentioning for discretization, so for spatial results, you have to have a georeferenced basin model. So those elements, those sub-basin elements, they really have to be georeferenced. And the good news is there are some tutorials and guides out there to show you how to take those existing projects that maybe you, you created 5, 10, 15 years ago and easily and quickly georeference them. So you can use existing shapefiles and georeference those elements. Um, if you want to start an HMS project and you already have shapefiles, then you could create a project from scratch just by importing those polygons and polylines from those shapefiles. So there's a tutorial for that, too. And so you're probably going to get tired of me saying there's a tutorial for that, but really there is a tutorial for that now. Um, and then the last one is you can go ahead and start using those, the new GIS tools in HMS. So you can load in your terrain model. You can delineate sub-basins and streams and whatever you need to do to define that hydrologic connectivity. You can now do that within HMS. I, at this point, I really cannot think of a reason why you need to use GeoHMS anymore. All those capabilities that GeoHMS have 
are now in version 4.7 and 4.8 of HMS. All right, so that's, you have to georeference your basin model elements. The next thing, so if you want to see gridded spatial results, so then you need to use or make sure the basin model or the sub-basin elements are using the Mod Clark transform method or the new 2D diffusion wave method. So you need to use one of those two for the transform method. And then within the discretization, you need to make sure that either structured discretization or un unstructured discretization are selected, or you could use the file specified option and reference an existing SQLite or HDF file. Okay, so that's for gridded spatial results. If you do want to see the results just at the sub-basin scale, then you need to make sure that your transform method is one of those basin average unit hydrograph methods or the kinematic wave. So if you're using the Clark method or the SCS or Snyder method, you need, then you're going to see results at the sub-basin scale. And then finally, discretization method. For this option, then you're going to use that old format, the, what we call the GeoHMS format, that .mod file right there. And then again at the bottom there is a tutorial for that. So if you want to see how you could take that existing project that maybe you use GeoHMS to create and then convert to using the new structured discretization, then you can walk through that tutorial right there at the bottom of slide 18. All right, and then there's a tutorial for this example too. So there's a, something showing how to Visualize spatial results. There's a step-by-step -step, um, instruction and data set. So if you go to this tutorial on slide 19, um, you can download the, the main stem Columbia, the data, and then the, um, the following, there's the terrain model. And so this is really an example that pushes the boundary. So this main stem Columbia project is a 14,000 square mile HMS model. That's the domain of the, the basin model. And there are many, I didn't, forgot to count how many grid cells there are in the model, but there's a lot. And so you'll notice when you do go to this tutorial, it does take some time to process that, that visual information, but it's not too bad. All right, so the next step here is turning on spatial results. So there are things that you have to do. So on the simulation run component editor, so we have that, that figure in the upper right. And then in the forecast alternative component editor, you should see these options here for spatial results. And so if you want to visualize those results, you have to turn it on. By default, spatial results is turned off. And then once you turn on spatial results, you want to turn on the interval for the spatial results. And I think this is a great opportunity here for just to talk about, so whenever you run the simulation, the simulation is going to be computed at that, that time step that you specify. So if you run the simulation at 15 minutes, then the program is going to compute flow, stage, basin average precept, grid cell precept, you name it for each time step within the simulation. Sometimes for those larger model domains, you don't want spatial results at that same um, detail. You might want those spatial results at a daily time step, especially if you're doing a, a long-term simulation. So you get to choose the interval for those spatial results. And then the last bullet on this slide shows that there is going to be a performance hit when you turn on spatial results just because the program is going to save some additional information. So be ready for that, especially for those larger, those lar larger models. Um, you would notice the, um, the amount of time does go up during the simulation. All right, so that was the component editor for the simulation run and forecast alternative. Once you have turned on spatial results, then you'd be able to choose which results you want to view in the basin model here on the um, toolbar. So this is the spatial results toolbar that I have highlighted in red on this figure. So you should notice this now in version 4.7. Um, you're going to see this toolbar. And then if I go to the next slide, you can see the, the different components of that toolbar. So on the left side, we have the area where you choose the output that you want to visualize. And so for now, the, the types of output that you're going to visualize are going to be those from the meteorologic model. So your incremental precipitation, your snow water equivalent, things like that. And then you're also going to have just a few of the results from the basin model for now. So I think the ones that it has listed right here on this slide, you're going to be able to see your incremental losses or your cumulative losses in excess from the basin model. And then finally, if you're using the, the new 2D diffusion wave transform method, 
then you would be able to see some of these cell average information, like your cell average velocity and the water surface elevation. And then this is a, talking about the, the performance hit. So there is going to be a little bit of a performance hit here. So what I have on this slide shows that the very first time you attempt to visualize those spatial results, you're going to notice that the, the software is going to process those tiles. And it's going to take anywhere from a couple of seconds up to two minutes, depending on, the, again, the size of the base and model. And some of this processing that you notice, it's only going to happen the very first time you try to visualize those spatial results. Um, the second and third time and so on after that, once some of this information has been processed, it, the program doesn't process it again. So you'll be able to see as those results change for each simulation run, it's going to be much snappier to visualize those for the, the subsequent runs. And then finally here we have some options. So you can choose different color ramps and scales for those spatial results. So if you want to see your snow water equivalent using the sequential purple-blue option, you can choose that. You can choose the, um, the minimum and maximum value that is used to set the scale for those results. And then also for looping through the animation, you can control how fast or slow the, the looping goes. All right, so let me jump into a demonstration. So first I'm going to jump into the, the larger model. So this is the one that's downloadable from that tutorials and guide page. And so for this one, all I did is I, I went ahead and selected the simulation run and then the result I want to see. The reason I did this is it does take a bit longer for this one. And so I forgot to mention this. So to see those spatial results, you do need to choose a simulation run. So that's what I have chosen right here. And then once you have the simulation run selected, it's been computed, then you should see a drop-down list right here. And you should see all the different types of output that you could choose. I'm going to go ahead and choose Sweep. I've already set the color ramp and scale. And so just to see how it's going to look, so you can advance the, the animation forward, and you can see how this week grows. So the simulation starts in October. We get to November, December, and then you can see the SWE is really deep in some places, and it's shallow or it has melted between storm events and other places. So you can see this type of information. For the other example here, I'll jump to this basin model. This basin model does not use the Mod Clark transform method. It uses the Clark transform method. And so since it does, I'm going to see my incremental precipitation for each sub-basin element. So let me zoom in just a bit. Oops. There we go. So you can see the animation play. So it might not be as valuable at the sub-basin scale, but at least you can get an idea for at different time steps during that simulation, um, where were the most intense areas of precipitation, or did you have some period with no precipitation? All right, so that's that model. That's the main stem Columbia. Again, that one is a large project, about 14,000 square miles. The other project that I have here, This is my Coyote Creek example. There's a number of tutorials and guides that use this one. And so what I'm going to show first is, so using a standard hydrologic grid 2,000 meter resolution, you can see how the precipitation varies for this simulation. So I'm going to play it right here. So there's the precipitation. And it lines up with that, that two-kilometer grid, right? All right, if I jump to the other basin model that I have here, so this is one where I'm using the, the, a 2D mesh that RAS generated for me. I imported that into HMS. And let me just zoom in real quick. So this mesh represents grid cells at a 400-foot spacing. So you can see those right here. I can then, let me choose my simulation run first, and then I'll choose incremental precipitation. There 
Let's see. I don't see much. Let me zoom back out just a little bit. What's challenging here is even though the, the resolution is much smaller, so we have 400 foot resolution, the, the boundary conditions, the precipitation that I applied to it, it was at a two kilometer resolution. So you're not going to see much spatial variability here. It's going to look just like the previous animation, right? It's going to look like um, the grid cells are going to be visually much bigger in this example. But what HMS is really doing behind the scenes for each of these 400 foot cells, think about the program finding the centroid of that cell, and then it's going to intersect the location of that centroid with the precipitation that's above it. And so really, it is computing or finding the, um, the precipitation for those smaller cells. It's just what we applied to it was a much different resolution precipitation. So you can see the precipitation that way. But if I want to look at the results from the actual 2D simulation, so let me choose my average cell velocity right here. So I'll advance in time just a bit. So we had some precipitation being applied. And then you can start to see as the precipitation intensity increases, and then we have more in the channel networks, then those velocity values are going to increase. Okay? So you can start to see that type of information with this new capability in HMS. And I'm sure what you're saying is, yeah, but where's the legend, where's the, the scale and all of that stuff? Well, let's talk about that. So we have an initial release. So this is an initial capability that we have in HMS 4.7 and 4.8. But what we're working on this year is to improve those capabilities. All right, so we have a, a laundry list of new things that we want to add to improve this, this option. And so, for example, we want to be able to, to visualize um, air temperature. Right now you can't do that in version 4.7 and 4.8. Um, being able to export spatial results to a GeoTIFF file. So if you want to choose a certain um, location during or time step during the simulation and write that information out. Yep, you should be able to do that. Um, we want to export animation files and visualize the minimum and maximum for that entire simulation and so on. So we know that there's some improvements to be made, but initially now you have some capability to visualize how those results are changing across the watershed. All right. And then this last slide here, so questions from you all. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, just want to leave you with, again, if you check the website, you can download the tutorials and guides and see some of these newer features. Um, the training material is up there, so if you want to look at um, different um, videos or PowerPoint slides or workshops, you have access to those too. And then if you want to download the, the PowerPoint file for this presentation or eventually see the, um, the video from this, it will be added to that web page that are on the right. All right, so I'll open up to any questions. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Just keeping up with questions as well as I could in the chat while we were on going. Um, I'll just mention up front, I pulled out a few that we can talk about here, but um, if we didn't get to your question or if we don't get to your question, please send us an email and we'll get back to you guys to uh, the best of our abilities. Uh, first one was from Ryan. Um, he was asking if we can get the presentation for future reference. I'll just say, yes, we're recording the presentation, um, and we're also going to provide the PowerPoint for here. So if you're interested in grabbing all the links that are in there, for sure, um, do that. But I would recommend adding what Matt is showing right here, the Tutorials and Guides page, to your uh, browser um, go there quickly. I use it myself all the time. We are putting a huge amount of effort into updating the tutorials and guides. So if you want an example of basically how to do anything in HMS, check that out. Um, the next one is for Tommy. Um, this one was from Brian Robinson who was asking, when converting a project that doesn't have terrain data, obviously this process, I think he was talking about the um, generating grid cells won't work. We can bring in a terrain, but Tom said, and still need the flow direction grid, is that generated just by clicking preprocessed drainage on the GIS menu? And then should this gridization work? Now, Tommy, you're on mute. I was on mute. 
Okay, yeah, that's a good question, and I know I kind of went quickly through that. I said to generate uh, either a grid cell file or a new structure discretization, you needed to have terrain, or maybe I said flow direction. I think I said flow direction. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. But getting to flow direction in HMS is now pretty easy. So you can bring in a terrain. Usually we go to the USGS National Map Viewer and pull in some terrain data. And I usually do a little pre-processing in a GIS, like I clip it down to my basin and things like that, and maybe mosaic a few terrain, uh, terrain tests if I need to for a larger basin. So I'll do that, and then I'll import my terrain. And so once the terrain's in HMS getting to the flow direction, there's a pre-process sinks function, which will fill in all of the sinks in the raster. And then there's a pre-process drainage, which will calculate the flow direction and flow accumulation grids. So getting to the to the flow direction point, the point where you can calculate either the grid cell file or the structure discretization is really the real part part is just getting the terrain into HMM. I mean it's not hard, but you just have to do that and then from there it's pretty easy to go through two or three steps to arrive at a flow direction grid. And Matt is showing your tutorial and guide that does just that right here. So um, go and check that one out in particular if you're uh, interested in it. Good question. All right, next one was from Matt. This one was from Kevin McAllister. He was asking um, when you mentioned it takes a little bit of time to pre-process some of these tiles, he was asking if the entire Columbia would be a good idea to use in this case. Any words of advice on that? <laughs> Um, no, um, yikes is the first thing that I say, um, because I, I noticed just for the main stem, which is what, maybe maybe 10% of the entire Columbia Basin, it takes two minutes. And so, of course, we want to get there, I think, in the future, but maybe right now or at today's, it might not be a good idea to attempt to visualize visual results for the entire basin. but. Um, in the future, yes, let's do it. I would love to, to see the storms move across the entire um, watershed and watch SWE build up across the entire watershed. That would be fantastic. I would definitely add, please give it a try. Push the limits. We're interested to hear how the software doesn't uh, work. So I'm going to make things better in time. Next question was from Ryan. Uh, Matt, actually, I was wondering if can you bring back up your HMS project for the main stem Columbia? Yeah. Ryan was asking about the scale that's being used for spatial results. So can you bring up the cog wheel animation for the spatial results, the cog yeah. wheel uh, setup? Oh, yeah. And give a little bit of a discussion on that one. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So with this model, it's going to take just a second to load. So you notice even with just sometimes loading the spatial results, it takes about five to ten seconds. Um, when you're doing a webinar, it takes even longer, I swear, just to make you sweat. So we're choosing SWE right here. Once SWE has been chosen, and there's a little pause, then I can choose the, the properties editor. Right here, it's going to take just a second, and that's just a byproduct of this model. Since this domain is so large and there's tons of data out there, it takes a long time. If this was a smaller project, then this this properties editor would load much faster. And so here, I'll pull these. So this is the color ramp and scale editor. So this is what I'm using to visualize the snow water equivalent. And so let's see here. So it looks like I chose sequential blue. I chose the linear scale. And so since I chose the linear scale, I get to choose what the min and max values are. And I chose for now just a max of 15 inches of SWE. So let me close. And so you'll notice for some of these time steps, especially in this portion of the watershed, we've already hit that maximum 15 inches pretty early on here in, in December. Um, but I could go back and I could change that maximum to be 40 or 50 inches and you'd see better spatial resolution of how this we is building in this portion up here if I did that. Um, 
I think, Mike, what was the question? Yeah, that, was, that was it. Um, oh. I think there might have been a second part to it. I'll also say the uh, screen capture that you had of all the JIRA tickets, um, just a mention of, like, these are all the things we want to do for spatial results, like adding a legend um, and better usage of think, things in here. I think Josh had a – Josh Mellinger had a question about that mm -hmm. in the chat that was along those lines. It was, can you view two at one time or something like that, and that's mm -hmm. another one we have on the list. Yes. So that can – yes, that's another question for you, Matt. Can model SWE be compared with observe SWE, for example, showing two data sets at once or a difference between the two? Right, right. Yeah, so right now that is not something you can do, but that's what we want to get to for sure. That was one of the, the requests from the, um, the water management folks is we want to be able to see um, how well the, the model is tracking the snow water equivalent compared to some observation or compared to some other model output. And so for sure we want to show that. Um, but, yeah, it's on our list, um, and we want to get to it this year. A never-ending list of enhancements. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I had a good one from Avital. Tommy, do you recommend computing a structured grid for any older HMS projects to replace all mod files? Yeah, make all the mod files disappear. Now, <laughs> mod files are <laughs> fine. They work. They're lean and mean. Um, the the biggest benefits like we showed that you get from this new structured discretization or unstructured is we have that spatial awareness so now we can see the grid cells and we can also display results on them. And I I personally I like being able to see the grid cells and I like the users being able to view the grid cells because before often would get gridded data issues and it would be this grid cell isn't intersecting this basin. So if the users are actually able to visualize their grid cells, that's like step number one in troubleshooting. It's like, do your grid cells cover the entire modeling domain? And in this case, you can see them. So I, I think it's just, it helps and there's like that little level of troubleshooting. And then the other reason why I think the grid cells are important, I think I saw a question about this, is that now your data doesn't necessarily have to match the projection of, of the basin. With the dot mod approach, it was very important that all of your process precipitation data aligned with your dot, dot mod grid cell files so they were created in the same projection and they're the same size. And so with structured discretizations, now that's no longer an issue, those grid cells can kind of they reproject to whatever the incoming data is. So there's definitely some benefits to the structured and unstructured discretizations. I'm not saying, you know, go through and update all of your old projects unless you unless you want some of these benefits. That's the reason to do it. If I was creating a new project from day one, I'd start with structured or unstructured discretizations. Sweet. Good, Good one. Let's see. I have another one from the Omaha District. They're wondering if this model Processes Sergo soils data yet? That's Tommy. That's a question for you. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. And there's some tools out there that process right now. There's tools uh, the the calculator that we have in the global editors. So some of the global editors now have a field calculator that will calculate values based on rasters right now. So most of the Sergo data is in vector format. So the only way really to process Sergo would be to convert it to rasters first, which sometimes we find ourselves we'll do that at our office. Um, not too big of a deal if you're okay in a GIS. Directly working with Sergo, yeah, we're not sure where we're going to take that. We have a few a few things in the works, um, and it's just a matter of how directly do we interact with Sergo because that the Sergo kind of changes in time. I I was just looking at it last year and. The modern, the most modern Sergo is, I think I started when it was like Sergo was at like a county level, then they went to G Sergo, and now there's like a newer variation of that. So, you know, how tightly we couple or how tightly we code around Sergo is the question. I'd like to keep it somewhat abstract so that changes in Sergo don't mean we have to update our code. But um, I'll say there is some functionality in there to work with rasters, which is a pretty generalized approach, and we're, we're 
kind of coming up with options and thinking of ways to work with vector data and best work with vector data in a generalized way. Sure, and I also pulled that question out because it's a nice lead into the next webinar. We have a million topics that we want to discuss and a million new enhancements within HMS to show you. Um, the ones we want to show you next time for next quarter are specifically the things that Tommy was just talking about. And Matt is showing you a tutorial and guide on how to do some of those um, computations, either within GIS or natively within HMS. So we definitely made enhancements to the way that those work. And I also know that the RAS team is hard at work at this question, too. So there's advancements coming at you from all angles here. We will talk about this next time as well. Good question. Can you answer Don's question? That's a good one. The model projection, is when you're using structured discretizations, it does not need to match the gridded rainfall data, which is very nice. Carl asked, uh, this one's from Matt. How do results, I'm supposed he's referring to um, gridded simulations. How do the results from gridded simulations compare to lumped parameter models? All right, let's look at that. That's a good one. So it's a pretty complex question too. So let me go to the, the easy part of that first. Let me go to this model here. So even though you might have gridded precipitation, Uh, this one. Ah, there we go. So here we go for this simple model. So we have one subbasin right here, and then within that subbasin element, we're using that 2,000 kilometer structure discretization. And so we can apply that precipitation to the structure discretization. If I'm not using a gridded loss method, then the program would take that um, precipitation, it would use for each of those grid cells. It would use the same loss information, compute an excess, compute the losses, and then that would be routed to the subbasin outlet using that. In this example, it's using the Mod Clark transform method. So it's not a true cell-to-cell -cell routing. Um, so if you wanted to look at the basin average precipitation, then you would look in the output DSS file, and you can see for the, the entire simulation for each time step, you can look at, well, that is the output, the um, subbasin average precipitation. And what you get with spatial results, though, is now you can also include, well, how does the cell precipitation vary through that time window? And so that's what you get with spatial results and how the program's tracking with um, discretization. Um, with flow, though, so if you're doing the 2D transform option, then there's going to be more results in that file. So instead of excess precipitation from each of these grid cells, being routed to the outlet using that, that simplified linear reservoir approach within Mod Clark, what you get with the 2D flow option is that excess is going to be routed to the next cell downstream and so on through the entire 2D mesh. And so in that example, um, it's just a different approach, right? You're, you're trying to simulate the, the physics of the hydrologic processes for, for over, overland flow routing. And so I said it earlier, of course, I'm going to say it again. There's a nice tutorial for this subject. Um, it's one of my favorite. It's one of the longer tutorials. Let's see here. If you go to the bottom of what we have for tutorials and guides, there's one about comparing HMS discretization and transform methods. And so you can get a flavor for if you're using the Clark option, the Mod Clark option, the, the 2D diffusion wave option. So you can look at how results would compare against those. And really what it's going to come down to is the results are going to be different for sure, right? Because you're modeling the different hydrologic processes at different scales. And you're using different assumptions. And so they're going to be different. Um, but what you get with hydrologic modeling and what you should do with modeling in general is you have to calibrate the model. And so, um, you're going to take those assumptions that you have, you're going to take your observations, observe flow, observe precip, and you're going to calibrate those important parameters based on um, what you think is reasonable to reproduce the, the flows at whatever location you have those observations at. Um, but go ahead and take a look at this tutorial and guide, and you can see for different basin configurations, so it also explores modeling this entire watershed with one subbasin versus, I can't remember the number, maybe nine subbasins, and you can look at 
simulation run times. You can look at how well results um, look to the observed results. I think what it shows is the simplest configuration, just the one sub-basin configuration gives really good results. Um, yeah, so you can see things like that. And then I'll close here at the very bottom here. You can see the run times, right? So one sub-basin element for that entire watershed model runs in one second versus if you want to do the, the 2D simulation approach uh, with seven minutes and four seconds back when I, I ran through this. If I were to update these numbers nowadays, there's been some improvements with the run times. I believe the 2D simulation is around four minutes now. I'll stop there. No, excellent, excellent, excellent. That was a great response. And I sent that one to you because I know you put a lot of effort into this tutorial and guide. Um, this is a really good read for anybody who's interested in exploring the differences between the different discretization options for a sample watershed um, outside of San Francisco. So very cool stuff that's going on there. Ellen asked if these uh, websites are publicly available. I'll go ahead and say, yes, they are publicly available. Um, all of our documentation and everything like here, you can see right now, it's open and available to everybody. Um, Matt did mention earlier that uh, this course, our kind of stacked overflow for HEC, is publicly available. However, only folks from the core can get um, the ability to post questions currently. Others can see it, but only folks in the core that they can post questions. Hey, Mike, can you mention also the email list? Oh, thank you for reminding me about that. Yes, I did want to say um, the PowerPoint presentation and everything like that is going up on our website. We'll send out a link to all of this information to those that are on our email list. So you can get to our email list from our website. Uh, can you share that real quick, Matt? So if you go to HEC Soft, Google HEC Software, and it'll take you to our website, and you'll get to the HMS page, and there is an email list. Uh, instructions. Right there. Yeah, there. Yep. So. And there are instructions in there. Send us an email with that. We keep, we keep this info, and we'll send uh, a list out to everybody. And we also keep you guys up to speed on all the releases, too. So anybody who's on this list, you guys will be the latest and greatest info. Anything you want to add on that one, Tommy? I know you've been... Uh, the no, that's exactly that it. Uh, we're going to... Yeah, we, we usually, every time a beta or a new release goes out, we usually shoot it out to the email list. And then for some of this new training material or these webinars, we'll probably send it out. And we, we try not to spam. We're very conscious of sending to the email list. One of the cool new things with the latest uh, HMS beta is that we have in-app notifications. So the app will tell you that there's a new version or a new beta available. So that's cool, I think, but that means one less email we have to send to tell you that. So look for that. But we will for, like, major releases. And, hey, we just added all of this new content to the website. We'll send a blast out to the email list so you, you know that it's there. Yeah. Okay, with that, we're nearly at the end of our time. I want to be conscientious of everybody's availability and other commitments. I'll leave it open to Matt and Tom. If you guys have any closing words you should like to add. Here, I'll, you, you can go first, Tom. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was a, a – I felt like a, a good presentation. The, the biggest thing I'll say is that a lot of this – um, we're just trying to keep up. We have a lot of new features coming, and there's so many cool things we could show you, and we're trying to pick off the biggest uh, the biggest items first. So this was – discretizations was a big thing about six months ago, and since then we've, we've added a lot of new things. So keep in tune with all that we're doing to stay up on the latest and greatest, and we'll try and get these webinars caught up with where the development is. Perfect. And then if we didn't answer your question today, please – follow up with us, send any one of us on the HMS team or at HUC um, the question, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And if you're interested in partnering with us on one of the tutorials and guides or some of the training material, if you have an idea for a training module that you think is really important for you, your district, or the court, please let us know. We would love to work with you get you involved in writing the tutorials and guides, um, helping us answer questions, helping us with training. Um, we could take all the help, and we want to work with you for sure. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. 
thank you all for attending. I really appreciate the time. Um, keep your eyes out. We'll send a new email and meeting invite for the next quarter's presentation as well. So, thanks, everybody.